welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Colleen Sinette Jennings, Professor of Theater at American University and your moderator for today's program. Theater is a meeting place of all the disciplines. In Michael Frayn's play Copenhagen, history and science meet on stage in bold new ways. Copenhagen is a play currently being produced in theaters across the United States. Its three actors take us on a roller coaster ride of happy memories, regret, betrayal, and head stretching science. <coughs> it's my pleasure to introduce you to five marvelous guests who are going to help us explore this exciting play from many different perspectives. Dr. Romeo Senyan is Professor Emeritus of Physics from the American University. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Robert L. Beisner is Professor Emeritus of History from the American University. So glad you could join us. Good morning. It is an, indeed an honor to introduce you to the actors who are, bring us on an amazing journey and show us the characters on stage. Marriott Hartley plays the role of Margrethe. Miss Hartley has been an actor on stage, screen, and television since 1950. Welcome. Len Cariou has been an actor on stage, screen, and television for 40 years. He plays the role of Niels Bohr. Good morning. Good morning. The role of Werner Heisenberg is played by Hank Stratton. Mr. Stratton also work, works regularly in film, television, and theater. Good morning. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us, all of you. And the first question really is to everyone. Since we're speaking to people from different disciplines, I wonder if you could give me a very short two-sentence summary of what the play is about from your perspective. Anybody can start. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm impressed by the two scientists, uh, two of the greatest scientists uh, of the last century, the 20th century, and uh, the uh, struggle that they went through in uh, uh, deciding whether to build a bomb or not to build a bomb. Uh, and uh, I think that they, uh, they would have preferred, I'm sure, of uh, conducting their research as they uh, were used to. But now, all of a sudden, they are faced with a uh, moral dilemma of what to do about the bomb. Mm. I think the great thing about this play is that it gets a sense of history right. Um, many people learn history as a series of dates and names and events sort of strung out in a linear line and you get these appalling test exams of the five causes of World War II <laughs> and so forth as a result. It's not the way it is. I mean, history is irrecoverable. I mean, we can't recover it. All we have are what it's left in its tracks and we have to interpret whatever those tracks are. And I think that's what Frayn does in this play and the way he revisits and replays scene after scene is the same thing historians do. So that's why we have thousands of books about World War II already and we will have even more because historians are trying to get it right. From your point of view? Well, it's interesting because uh, Margaret is definitely the observer. And um, what I really view um, as I watch my beloved husband um, in, in what she apparently considered to be a hostile visit from uh, Werner Heisenberg, these are old friends. Uh, and it's literally, on some level, a mystery. We try to find out from the very beginning when Mar Margaret comes out and says to her husband, but why? Why did these two, why did Werner Heisenberg come to Copenhagen in 1941 in the middle of a war? Uh, what was the reason? And we have three attempts to go back to 1941, and it's done brilliantly through lights and everything, uh, to, to keep trying to solve the mystery, um, very much like scientists would. So. Mm -hmm. What about you play Niels Bohr, what, from your perspective? Well, I think the play is about, um, <coughs> about relationships, uh, human relationships as well as um, particles and waves. It's also, I think, um, a play about uh, how we observe uh, life as it unfolds. Uh, particles change when they're observed, so do human emotions, um, and especially through the lens of memory. I'm just going to piggyback on what I've already heard that's okay. so clear and articulate. I think the play is about so many things in each night. The thrill of playing it is each night, as the three of us talk about all the time, a different, a different thought will emerge, a different, uh, a different idea that Frayn has laid out will emerge. I think the play is not only about the events, the historical events, 
But I think the playwright is trying to say things through these events about human frailty, about the reliability of memory. And obviously, or not so obviously, <coughs> the ambiguity, I don't want to say uncertainty because it will just be it, it will just be too pat, but the ambiguity of consequence, action and consequence, and how so many different things can live within the human soul in concert. Uh, that's what the play is about to me, and that's the thrill of playing. And I think one of the things Great. that Margrethe feels is that Heisenberg, who, you know, skis left, skis right, or thinks about it and dies, all the way through he skis his way left, right, left, right, all the way through the play. And I, I, I believe that she truly believes that he is not being accountable. Um, and why, why she is in the play is to have the clarity, I think, of the female mother voice to say, all right, you guys have been playing with your cat pistols and you've been playing with your marbles behind the barn, but look what you've done. You've made a more efficient machine for killing people and it may now kill everybody, every man, woman, or child. Right, the and, what, and what's interesting is that Werner Heisenberg actually had nothing to do with the actual construction of building an atomic bomb. And Niels Bohr was at the center of the Manhattan Project. And so what Frayn does is he invites the audience to draw its own conclusions about action and consequence. In, in World War II, it's very clear who the good guy and the bad guy was. Yeah. But in this play, what we're allowed to do is we're allowed to glimpse the human, the human condition at work and the engine of World War II. And as people, because the, the wonderful thing about this is, is it is on, in the context or canvas of limbo. So we get to perform or say the things right. that often these characters as real people, because they're all real people, Danes, didn't you know, particularly talk about their personal feelings, but they now get to respond in ways that they would never have been able exactly. to respond in life. Just so that limbo is, means we're all dead. <laughs> so all the characters yeah. are dead we're all at the dead. beginning of the play. Yeah. Dr. Beisner, can I ask you to give us a little bit of an historical context of the play? What was going on at the time? It occurs in the fall of 1941. And, um, October, September. Go ahead. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, September, um, October. Germany is at the height of its power. I mean, they've uh, all of continental Europe is a Nazi empire at this point. Uh, Britain is left, uh, pretty much feeling on the ropes. Uh, Germany has now attacked the Soviet Union, and nothing bad has happened to the Germans there yet. They're approaching Moscow, so. Um, it's a period when the Germans are riding very high, and the opponents who are left, the Americans aren't in the war yet, but they will soon be, and the British are prepared to do anything to turn this situation around, and that means any weapon that's available. And I'd like to add, too, that four years after these events, of course, I mean, the events of the plague go up to 1947 as well, but four years after 1941, when the bomb is used, by that time the war has been so bloody, so many people have been killed, the carnage has been so great mm. that the use of the bomb, in my view, when it was finally used on Japan, was less of a shock to contemporaries than it was to people later. I mean. People were simply inured to violence and killing by that mm -hmm. time. So the notion of a bomb possibly being created but not used seems to me fundamentally sort of an ahistorical idea. Mm -hmm. I think also one of the interesting things <coughs> about this is that uh, uh, if the Germans had not been so anti-Jew, if they had not sent their Jews away, they would have had an That's atomic right. bomb. Yeah. Mm. And the irony of this is just so stunning to me. I mean, I'm, I'm there every night speaking the Jewish plight, which is, uh, Frayn has been accused of not talking about that enough. But mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, certainly Margaret is always in there saying, my God, don't you realize? I'm sorry, I didn't yes. mean and, and this is particularly true because the, the Jewish population referred to in this play has to do with the scientists, the Jewish scientists. Absolutely. Right. And, and also that scientists. Niels Bohr is half Jewish. And half Jewish, and yes. so he gets sent away in 1943. Right. Let me pick up on the scientific issues, if I might, Dr. Senyan. Can you give us, these are very complex issues. Issues, I realize, but can you give us sort of a simplified version of what the scientific issues are at the heart oh, of the Oh, good. Play? Yeah. Okay. 
this. Have at it. <laughs> I see them really on the spot here. <laughs> so I better get it right. Uh, well, uh, you know, the, the uh, question was uh, that uh, the discoveries were just coming uh, through. Uh, you know, in the 30s, uh, there was uh, the discovery of fission uh, as being one viable uh, means of uh, producing uh, destructive bombs, and uh, uh, although people were not really quite sure how to work it out, uh, the possibility there was just, uh, you know, overwhelming. And so, when uh, by the time in 1941, when uh, Heisenberg goes to Copenhagen to visit Bohr, uh, already uh, the bomb idea was, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say accepted, but people were working hard on trying to uh, build it. And uh, it is still a puzzle of why uh, Heisenberg uh, did go to Copenhagen, but uh, the uh, idea of uh, uh, building the bomb was in uh, both uh, scientists' mind, both Bohr and uh, Heisenberg. Uh, and uh, there are some questions whether uh, Heisenberg was uh, able and uh, uh, whether he had the knowledge of how to build the bomb. I think that uh, he, he would have done it, you know. On the other hand, uh, the, uh, all the scientists who did uh, flee Europe uh, and uh, settled in the United States and the American scientists there were working on the bomb. And so when uh, Heisenberg came uh, and started talking about uh, the bomb to, Hei uh, to Bohr, uh, Bohr got very concerned because he thought that uh, the uh, Germans were building the bomb. Turns out that the Germans were not able with their technology and with their, uh, the science was there, but the technology was not available. And so most likely they would not have been able to build the bomb in four years. Uh, if the war lasted longer, maybe perhaps, but uh, even then, uh, there was so much destruction on the uh, industrial, st uh, over uh, the structure uh, of the industrial uh, factories and everything else in Germany was all destroyed. So the Germans probably would not have been able to. But uh, that was uh, something that the Bohr was very concerned about, that the Germans could. And so when uh, he went to uh, Britain and the United States, uh, then he participated in uh, you know, developing the bomb. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Germans did not succeed. OK. Mr. Cario, can I ask you, we have young people with us today. What do you think it might be in the play that would appeal to young people? We're talking about long ago. Well, I would hope, I would hope the history would, would uh, appeal to them. Um, just the history that the play tries, tries to focus upon. Uh, the moral issues, um, the, the fact that, um, that there was the, the anti-Semitic uh, situation by the Germans, uh, a cleansing of trying to get rid of all um, all of the Jews anywhere in Europe. Um, but I think also one of the things that I hope that they would take away from the play is that um, I had mentioned the relationships that, that went on. I think that's, it's vitally important that, that they, uh, the play, I think, says that Bohr and Heisenberg were like father and son. Mm. Um, and they both, they both loved one another. Um, Heisenberg had lost his father um, early in his life. Um, Bohr had lost two of his children. Um, and so I think there was a, uh, besides the fact that Heisenberg was a brilliant a scientist, I think that uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, a natural bond that happened between the two men. Um, and so he really became his mentor. And uh, I think that, uh, that it's important that people realize that these men, as brilliant as they were, um, were human beings. And they had uh, um, the foibles, and they had the agonies and the ecstasies of, uh, of what people go through during their lives. Um, it was a, obviously a terrible time uh, in history in the, uh, because most of Europe was under German occupation. Uh, people weren't really free to go uh, freely around uh, 
their homes and have a have a normal life, uh, even if you were uh, if you were thousands and thousands of miles from Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Beisner, to what extent are we living with some of the consequences of what went on during that period today? It's uh, sort of it's inescapable. I mean, first we're since the end of the Cold War, people have uh, a lot of people have sort of. Well, since 9-11, they perhaps have changed their mind, but there's a tendency to relax since 1989, 1990, with the end of the Cold War, because that was a period of great danger dominated by nuclear weapons. And the, you know, by the end of the Cold War, um, there were very few issues, actually, that divided the West and the Soviet Union anymore, except those weapons. And they were so dangerous, and they were set, they were ready to trigger, they were targeted. Um, so for a half century, we lived literally with the possibility of extinction from those weapons. That's a fairly powerful legacy right there. <laughs> yes. And now, most recently, we're again reminded, first of all, nuclear weapons are still around. A disorganized Russian state may very possibly lose control of some of their old armory. We don't know. And there are other forms of other weapons of mass destruction, biological warfare, chemical warfare. The whole notion of developing weapons that can kill masses of people. I mean, if, if there was ever a barrier against that thought, it's been breached long ago. Mm -hmm. So we have, considering the bloodiness of the century just passed, I think it would be very foolish to assume that even more horrendous things could not be in our future. So it's, it's, it's something that ought to be at the very, very top of any nation's political priorities is preventing such catastrophes. Mm -hmm. We have students here who are budding scientist, Dr. Sinhan. Can you talk a little bit about some of the issues that you hear in the play in terms of scientific issues? Uh, yes, uh, I th actually was impressed by uh, all the uh, things that were touched upon uh, in the uh, play. You know, all uh, the main uh, scientific discoveries of the last century were uh, uh, done uh, uh, by, well, I wouldn't say by the two of them, uh, but certainly uh, by also the other people who are mentioned uh, in the play, you know, practically just about all of them, uh, from Einstein to Fermi to uh, Chadwick, uh, all people who uh, are all Nobel Prizes, really. They all won Nobel Prizes. So it is a, a sort of a, a, an interesting play that uh, is, in a way, bringing to uh, the public uh, at large uh, uh, all this, this science that uh, uh, me as a scientist uh, uh, lived with, you know. But uh, it's sort of nice to see that all these things are coming through. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, let me say that uh, in uh, 1900, uh, there were some scientists, uh, Michelson was one of them, who said, uh, oh, everything is known about physics uh, and the mm -hmm. physical world and nature, you see. And then Planck came around uh, and Einstein came around and uh, just started a whole new uh, world uh, for us, you know. And uh, the consequences are uh, tremendous <coughs> in the sense that, uh, you know, we have all the uh, modern technology that we have. Uh, uh, partly it is based on the uh, 19th century, but partly is, uh, or quite a lot, is based on the 20th century. Mm -hmm. You know, all the things that we are doing now, if we did not have uh, um, the science of the 20th century, we would not uh, be able to do what we are doing now here. Okay. Let me ask the actors, this is a, on a very practical level, this is a language play. How did you learn the language? How do you maneuver your way through the language? I pray. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, it was very, very difficult. Um, I think primarily because we all had the, we all had our struggles with it because of the syntax in which the play is written. Uh, to be quite frank about it, nobody we know talks like this, and um, so just to have a framework uh, uh, 
to rely upon. It's not like doing a Neil Simon play or a, or a Herb Gardner play. Uh, this play is like almost like doing blank blank verse, uh, which was one of uh, the forms that Shakespeare used. Um, but also, I think because of the um, because we're talking about scientific things, and because these minds work in with such rapidity, um, I think we all had trouble just absorbing it and, and, and learning the text. Uh, we had a long rehearsal period. We had a rehearsal period of, what, five and a half weeks? Wow. And uh, uh, it was barely enough in which to learn the text and be comfortable with it. We had been asked to memorize it before we started rehearsal, so I desperately tried to do that. I got in my script, I think it was in May. And uh, I really was successful at doing it to a degree. Uh, I have people come over because I'm very ADD. <clears throat> so I, I, I learn by, you know, touching this and saying, hi, how are you? Gee, that's a great colored shirt. Um, how is everybody today? How's it? You know, and of course, we have three chairs. That's all we have. On and it was very difficult <coughs> for me to learn. Then 9-11 happened, and it all went out of my brain. And it was almost as if we had, I had to start all over again. And it was the, even more difficult sometimes than the words was uh, not moving in any um, organic way. Yes. We don't move in any organic way. Even when we get up from chairs, we move all the way around a chair. Um, and I just got lost several days. The guys <laughs> giggled at me a lot, but uh, I couldn't find the right chair to sit in. I mean, it got to be very confusing. <coughs> um, but I was I know how nervous I get about forgetting my lines. So after rehearsal, I, I hired somebody to come in and uh, for three hours, almost every night, every other night, we, uh, we just go over them and over them and over them and drill them like a pianist gets ready for a concert. <coughs> and the interesting thing about actually doing them is you, we, it is like doing Shakespeare. The emotion comes on the line. It's absolutely on the line. It is a non-indulgent, uh, emotionally non-indulgent play on that level. It's just right there. Until we talk about the children. One of the things I wanted to say, too, why, why I think some of the people might be interested in this, or if they see it and go, oh, that is interesting. We're talking about a completely different era, even though they are in limbo. It's a completely different era. Everybody here, you know, we're all Jerry Springer trained. Everybody talks about everything. And they don't, and they're Danish, and they're very, there's a repressive, a repressed emotionality about them. And that is interesting to me. Um, uh, it's, it's like watching a whole, and I think one of the reasons why Frayn wrote it the way he wrote it was because it's almost like a bad translation of a, of a Danish play, you know, almost, on some levels. It's very odd the way some of the words go. Um, I'm I'm shocked to hear that you guys had trouble learning this oh, play. Shut up. <laughs> I, I, I'm so sorry for you. We're older than you are. It okay. was, um, you know, it was a challenge for all of us. And in, when when I got the part, I immediately started reading the history. I had to find out the history and put the, the guy into context. And I also had to talk to scientists because so much of the burden of what Len and I do in the play is to. Uh, the, the language in which we traffic is science. So I had to learn at least an intuitive, I had to have an intuitive understanding of these principles. I will probably never have a mathematical understanding of these principles, although my arrogance has taken me in very unfortunate places in some audience talkbacks where I, <laughs> I think I know more than I do, but that's probably why I'm playing the <laughs> character that I'm playing. Um, but I also, I, I mean, I, I just had to, I, I looked at it, it's, it's interesting that the, the that my colleagues said say the same thing that I looked at it as Shakespeare, because the the interesting thing about those plays is that the muscle of the words is what allows the character to reveal himself. And I look at this play in exactly the same way, and I think it's a great play, and I think it will hold up for that reason. That all the action is is coming out of language, which well, is not to mean that it's dry. Sorry. Well, and one of the other things I would guess that keeps it interesting for you, you have audience on stage. Behind oh, you, yeah, please. Which is let's not even and you know what? Some we of had a woman with pink hair the other night, and one guy wore the cat in the hat. Do you remember yeah, that guy? Yeah, yeah. Black <laughs> and sure white do. stripes like this, all the, and ooh. Do you remember the gal that put her feet up on the rail? Oh yeah. She was at one of them. And then we get we get people who read through it, like. <laughs> 
home. And, They're and reading the play. Through well, the, we hope the they play. are. <laughs> during, the, during the Olympics, a guy sat up there with the with a uh, the American flag. the American flag yeah. shirt. Oh, I said you've seen the American flag, <laughs> right? But right. Uh, some of our best that audiences, isn't. especially the ones that are up in the gallery, are students, and yeah. I encourage any student to go and pay some, you know, few bucks and sit up on that stage. They're so engaged because they're curious. Yeah. And that's what this play is also about, is curiosity. This play does not play down to anybody. Anyway. And the other thing that I think we always forget to say is that it makes everything very available. We don't, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to, to get the ideas of the play. And also, there's a lot of humor in it. Yes. It's funny. Yes. <laughs> Oddly enough, it is. Yes. Um, Dr. Sanyan and Dr. Beisner, you knew of these figures long before we did, obviously. Has seeing the play changed your viewpoint on these characters in history? Um, it's not so much change, but there, there are some kind of new perceptions that um, came closer to the surface. One thing that struck me about the play was how it exhibits nationalism. Um, Heisenberg, what ever his thousands of motives might have been in the trip and in general during the war is a German patriot. He's not a Nazi, he's a German patriot. And there's a fabulous speech mm. about what Germany means to him. It's very emotional. I mean, and very moving. But you can pull Germany out of that speech and insert any country in the world. Yes. I mean, there, every single brand of nationalism is available. And I think it's very important, especially for American audiences, you know, to remember that USA, USA is not the only chant in the world. I mean, it, yes. I mean, well, and, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be a great power. Niels Bohr is from a little, helpless, weak country, Denmark, and he's offended by Heisenberg's behavior, partly out of nationalism, you know. Why should I go down and consort with the Nazis who have occupied us? Yes. The other thing that interests me about this nationalism theme is that these are two men from supposedly the most international of all communities, the community of science, where historically there's been a great deal of pride about not being nationalist, and yet both men are motivated by nationalist uh, feelings. Such a good point. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I would like to uh, pick up on uh, the international uh, aspect of science. Uh, yeah, it is true that uh, uh, there is nationalism in the sense that uh, people were proud uh, of their own origins. But there is uh, one thing that I want to stress, and that is. Uh, that the international collaboration among scientists is a really very, very uh, fruitful thing. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, if you think about it, during the uh, Cold War, uh, in spite of uh, the tension that there was politically between the uh, Soviet Union and uh, the West, uh, there was collaboration on mm -hmm. a scientific level, in spite of everything. Yes. Apart from the spying of uh, uh, Fuchs uh, and Ponte Corvo, and that's another story. But, uh, you know, the point is that uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, many of my colleagues, I never did go to Russia, but uh, some of my colleagues did go to Russia in the 70s, uh, right in the middle of the uh, Cold War. So uh, my, uh, it is true that there is nationalism, but on the other hand, uh, I would say that uh, that is one of the aspects that were brought out by the uh, play. It was unfortunate, uh, I must say, that, uh, uh, you know, the Nazism com came around uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, that sort of, uh, uh, as we was said before, uh, made uh, all the Jewish uh, uh, scientists uh, flee Germany and uh, that, uh, you know, it's something that is brought out by the play. And uh, uh, that somehow uh, broke this uh, kind of uh, Yes, nationalism, yes, but also a universality of science. Yes. And uh, so, uh, well, that's how the, the wars will do for you, yeah. Yes, yes. How have playing these characters changed you as actors, changed you as people, have they? It's made me a better listener on stage, I'll tell you that. <laughs> mm. I, can't, I can't do my laundry list for a second, and, I, and that just kills me.
<laughs> so much rather be thinking about uh, basketball. <coughs> but, um, yeah, absolutely. On every level, on every level, cellularly, emotionally. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, um, uh, it's a challenge every time we go out there. Uh, mm. Each night we go out because uh, uh, <laughs> the, even, though, even though everything is set uh, and we know exactly what we're going to say, or at least we hope we know exactly what we're going to say, um, the, uh, the uh, being observed by an audience, um, I think, gives us a, uh, a different take each time. Uh, that we go out on the stage. Um, it helps us, I think, to, um, to know that they're hearing it for the first time. It's, it's one of those plays where there's, a, there's something that's, that we say in the theater, well, remember, these people have never seen this play before, so it's the first time, so keep it fresh and keep it, uh, keep it pointed uh, for, this, for this audience. That really takes care of itself simply by the construction of the play, because this play is so dense, um, not so dense that you can't follow it, but because Frain, I think, brilliantly, by by looking at it from three different uh, from three different points of view, uh, three different drafts, if you will, as as we refer to it in the play, um, you can follow the play even if you don't absolutely comprehend what is being said in one passage. By the time he's repeated it a second and then a third time, you obviously. Uh, will understand the play. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's very little written about Margareta. Um, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to sit and talk to Neil's, uh, to, to their uh, grandson. Um, what helped me so much in getting inside her skin um, <coughs> as an American um, is, were the pictures of her. Mm -hmm. uh, I just fell in love with her and their relationship through the pictures how protective she was, how much she loved him, how much they had been through with the death of the two children, which often separates couples, yes. uh, brought them closer together. Um, and uh, I am affected by it. I mean, I never thought about life in scientific terms or in, you know, uh, and now I actually will sit and go, oh, that's interesting, that's like complementarity, or that's uncertainty, or that's, <laughs> and I'm, I'm fascinated with it, and I'm trying to read all these simple books, and. I'm never going to get it, but uh, uh, it's a whole, I'm very affected by every character I play, by literally getting and trying to get into their skin. And uh, I find it a meditative process. I find it, you know, I just, I find it, I find that it has a, sometimes a really unspoken effect. And yes, Hank is right. I'm, I'm very much more the listener in this piece than, than either of them. And um, I, I love listening. I mean, I have come to be a real active listener, and I, and I really love it. Yes. You were chatting a little earlier about how you hear new lines each night. And you also spend and a lot of And forget hours, because we've <laughs> never heard that one before, right? That's what happens to all of you us. always said that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, remember that one. Yeah. You also spend time with your back to a portion of the audience or to the gallery. I do. They and never do. Oh, oh, oh. Werner Heisenberg. I back the audience. I had a teacher actually who taught back acting. You know, it's really interesting. <laughs> yes. And I, I must say, there's one place where I do it, and I, I have such a good time because, uh, you know, hopefully through every part of an actor's body, you should really get on some level what they're feeling or what they're thinking. I'm going to be looking for that back acting tonight. I'll tell you exactly where it is. <laughs> I'm going to look for it. Ooh, well, I have to do it all back the time in the, in the dinner party. You know, I remember or, him uh, yeah. bringing yeah. back to us. Yeah. Uh, yes. Do you think there are overlaps between what actors do, what historians do, what physicists do? Absolutely. Oh my That's why this is a great play. How so? Because these, if we're doing our jobs every night, this is not a play about physics. This is a play about discovery, about human beings, about relationships, about consequence. And I don't know a single person alive that doesn't suffer from the same uh, curiosities about themselves and about the people around them. Yes. There's something else interesting, too, that strikes me that I'm not quite sure how I would be able to translate this into acting terms, but I bet it's there. 
Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that is dominant in the play is the sense that whatever one does in science, there at least at Bohr's insistence, there's a moral dimension mm. to every event. Mm. Philosophical consequences. And I think historians are very preoccupied with that. They don't necessarily put it out front or make it explicit, but it's part of thinking historically. Unless you're trying to Rose. arrive at a, <laughs> what is the moral meaning of these events. Mm. And um, and uh, actually, I would I'd I'd like to ask the actors if they think that's one of the things they're doing. That's absolutely dead on. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. know what's interesting is I was thinking back to something that you asked earlier about why would students want to see this, and I was I was sitting here thinking probably I should have thought of this long before this, but I grew up during the Vietnam War. And sense of patriotism, nationalism, and the idea of consequence of war was so different for me and my peers because there didn't seem to be any relevance. There just seemed to be death. And it seemed to be something that was looming out there that had nothing to do with morality, with principle, or with our lives. And now things are so different. Mm -hmm. Things are so different. And it's, it feels a little more like, like what it might have been at stake during World War II. For, for a contemporary uh, generation. Yes. Now. Mm -hmm. Some overlaps in terms of what the actors do in terms of your profession? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it is true that uh, it is uh, about uh, uh, moral issues and so on, but it is also about science uh, and how science uh, can become a moral issue. Uh, because, uh, you know, scientists uh, at times are accused of uh, not being uh, concerned about uh, uh, their, uh, the consequences of their own research. Uh, but that is not true. You know, I mean, uh, scientists uh, are producing uh, things for, uh, um, you know, the, for us, let's say. Uh, but, you know, one thing that uh, I can take as an example, which is far off from what we are talking about here, but you know, uh, the ozone layer, uh, the ozone hole, uh, that is such a big problem was and whatever. And uh, one thing that uh, we always don't keep in mind is that uh, actually scientists came up with the problem, uh, finding out that there was a problem with uh, the ozone uh, hole. And they were the ones, uh, in fact, even now, uh, scientists and NASA are the ones who are the most vocal about the problem that uh, the ozone hole is uh, creating for us. Mm -hmm. So it's not that uh, scientists are not uh, uh, concerned about it. In fact, they are greatly concerned. And uh, there was this moral issue uh, during uh, the uh, 1941, uh, you know, what to do with the bomb, uh, with that, uh, to use it or not. Uh, in fact, in 1945, when it was built, uh, there were several scientists who were questioning whether it should be used or not. And of course, uh, as uh, Dr. Beisner uh, pointed out, uh, maybe that should have been the case, and it did. Uh, was used uh, on, on uh, human beings. Uh, the decision is out of their hands. That's right. Mm. right that's but, right. Out of their hands. but also in, in the play Bohr, at one of the last things that Bohr says, um, uh, because he had gone to the Allied, to the Allied side uh, in 1943 and uh, came over to America um, and was part of the Manhattan Project. Along one with his son. Along with his son, yes. Uh, uh, one of the last things that that Frayn has Bohr say in the play is, uh, Heisenberg says to him, then you, uh, you went back to, uh, you were on your way back to uh, Los, Alamos. Los Alamos. And uh, Bohr says, yes, and to play my small but helpful part in the deaths of 100,000 people. Yes. Uh, so the moral issue there was, I mean, the, Bohr says it twice in the play. He, he refers to when, when Margreta brings, brings up the, uh, the idea of this thing that you've created that could destroy the entire world. Um, Frayn has Bohr say, uh, it breaks my heart every time I think of it. Um, so there, there was obviously those concerns that, that they had to live with the consequences of what they did. Um, yes. However, it it seemed to be the right thing to do at that time. And it was done, and that's also, also, I, I'm going to just uh, open the conversation up a little bit, because we'd like to invite callers to call in with questions. 
The number to call <laughs> is 800 578 one three nine six and we'll actually keep the discussion going and bring in members of our studio audience as well I, I just wanted to say Please one do. thing uh, that to me um, we often as young people take for granted uh, the role we will play in history and I think that it's so important to see history come to life I mean, you can read it in books, and sometimes you just don't get it because it's linear and it doesn't work and it's not processing. But when you see it on a stage that's so brilliant and so um, spare, and you get to experience uh, the making of the atom bomb, and literally there is a moment when you do feel the atom bomb uh, going off inside Heisenberg's head, which is the, one of the most astonishing theatrical moments. We, it, we need to keep history alive, particularly now when we're you know, discovering U-238 and U-235 in Russia, where we have, we're talking about Pakistan having, uh, having a, a bomb. I mean, what's yeah. happening over there? And yes. I, I think it's very important that we are aware of it. The residents since 9-11 has changed this play incredibly and brought it much closer to the surface, to, to all of our surface. And you are the, his, you are the future. So you must know what, what you know, this history is, hopefully so it won't happen again. And, and speaking of, of the voice of the future, with us in the studio are drama students from Hilton High School. Also, we have students from the Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology and their teacher, Betty Stiegel. And while we're waiting for callers to call in, let's start with questions from our studio audience, please. Uh, has the way you view your characters changed uh, since the information has come out from the Niels Bohr archive? Not for me. Not in the least. No, not in the least. Not in the um, least. I, I don't want to be simplistic about it, but uh, it, the, the, the revelations, if you will, were, uh, didn't reveal very much. Uh, we kind of knew that, uh, uh, we knew that he hadn't, that Bohr had not sent the letters to, uh, to Heisenberg, and frankly, uh, it's much ado about nothing. It's, um, it's interesting because there's been such a <clears throat> new awakened controversy because of the, of the revealing of these letters and mostly because of some sensational press, mainly the New York Times, that's trying to sell papers. But <laughs> what, uh, what these letters do uh, point out, and it's unfortunate that probably Michael Frayn didn't have them available to him when he wrote the play, is it showed how Bohr's mind worked. But in terms of historical context, it simply reconstructs what most historians already know from other accounts. Good. Another question? The scene involving Bohr's son reappeared at several key moments in the play. What meaning or metaphor did you see in this event, and how did it affect the relationship between Bohr and Heisenberg? Well, I think the, the, most, I think the reason that it's there, for me at any rate, is because we want, we want you as an, as an audience to never forget the human side of these people. That, uh, they may be talking about science and talking about bombs, etc. But they, uh, first and foremost, are human beings, and they, and they had gone through um, uh, the loss of a, of a child, I think, is, is probably one of the most profound things that, that can happen uh, to us as human beings. Uh, we, unfortunately, lost two. Uh, I think that Frayn is asking us to never forget that, that these minds, while they, they, may, be, uh, they may be brilliant and they may be um, seemingly uh, just doing science. Um, in fact, I say in the play, and I, I look back on a moment that I see every day in my head. Um, now, as far as the relationship uh, between uh, Heisenberg and, and Bohr, I think that from Bohr's point of view, um, it was, Heisenberg was, was some, maybe a, a replacement for the loss of Christian. Uh, but also there was a, a, a huge knife uh, plunged into his heart when the war broke out and, um, and they were no longer uh, as close as they could have been. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think I, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> once again, uh, sort of borrow what you've already said. But I think that it's also Michael Frayn 
telling us and teaching us something about action and consequence on a personal level. That uh, Niels Bohr watched his son drown when they were on a sailing trip, and he did not jump in and try to save him. And he's, he's got to live with that choice and that consequence for the rest of his life. Let me Was catch it a, a call here just for a second. Oh, hi, a call caller. coming in from Florida. I feel like Miss Cleo. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, hi. All right, go ahead, caller. What's your question? Yes, darling. Okay, hi. My name is Becky, and um, I've been watching, and they've been showing pictures of your set, and I was just wondering, why is the set so plain for this play? Why is the set so plain for this play? <laughs> no. Well, there are many theories about what the set is. Is it an atom? You know. What are, what are the three chairs? Are they, I mean, to me, they, they just look like uh, uh, Prince Albertstrasse uh, uh, <coughs> chairs, uh, questioning chairs, Nazi questioning chairs. It, we have a gallery where we have all kinds of people. Is that, the, is that a Nuremberg judgment? Is it a German th theater? Uh, uh, is it an operating room? Is it, a, I mean, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's an absolutely brilliant set for this spare piece of theater and it kills our legs every night because one <laughs> it's of on the a rake. highest rakes that ever. It's interesting that the caller uses the word plain as such a pejorative <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, I thank God for the, for the simplicity of the set every night because without that simplicity <coughs> the ideas and the words would probably be far more banal if we had actual representations of trees and living rooms and teacups and which they did microscopes yes, which they, they did. did once and Michael Blakemore came in to save the, the production director. and said well this has got to go you know and then they mm -hmm. played it on a blank stage and all of a sudden the play lived we have another call from Hopewell Virginia go ahead caller what's your question hello this is Joshua oh, and how I'm old are you Joshua hmm? how old are you I'm 12. Oh, <laughs> oh, great. Welcome. What's your question, Joshua? Why do scientists make devices to kill humans? Oh, Joshua. <laughs> At 12 okay, years old. Okay, we, we got three or four hours here. <laughs> How about a lifetime, Josh? <laughs> well. Doctors? Uh, well, scientists don't, uh, uh, thank you for the, your call. Scientists don't make uh, devices to kill humans. Uh, uh, scientists do uh, build things and invent things and whatever, but uh, uh, these things can be used for uh, peaceful purposes or it can be used uh, for, uh, um, you know, war purposes. And uh, sometimes it's beyond their control, like with the atom mm. bomb which was built, uh, you know, uh, scientists did build it. Yes, that is true. Uh, the question was, uh, should it be used or not? Uh, and many of the scientists did have some uh, problems with that. You have a I quick thought? That, I, I, I love you dearly, Romeo, but I think that's such a dodge. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, now it's getting oh, good. Hey, hey, Josh, watch. Uh, watch. <laughs> War and violence are unfortunately among the most ancient forms of behavior, and everybody takes part in it. And states men mostly. Yes, mm. men mostly. That's right. And while scientists may work at the behest of rulers and political figures, there's surely not a whole lot of historical evidence that they've had a hard time doing it either. Joshua, you asked a terrific question, and yeah. obviously there are well, lots of worried, different points of view. He's you. worried about that at 12. It's well, great. it's interesting, Thank you. though. I think um, freedom is sometimes uh, very costly, and, and it's hard won. And I think it, it can be very simplistically answered or not. I mean, we look at the Afghani women now, who are now able to, capable of going to school again, capable of not wearing their burqas, and that has only been able to come out of War. the kind of violence uh, that all <laughs> tribal mentalities uh, understand. Mm. And uh, it, it's a complicated, many-layered question. And freedom sometimes is very costly. Look at the history of our country. It's true. It's true. We have another question from the audience. Um, my question is sort of off topic. Um, I want to become a thespian. Like oh, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, an actor. Yes, okay. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what advice would you give me to accomplish that? Mm. Well, do it. I mean, yeah. I, there was a, a little girl who I just adore in Texas, and 
she talks like this. She said, you know, uh, her mother says she wants to be an actress. And I said, so are you working, are you working on street corners, literally? And she giggled. She was a big giggler. And I said, look, that's the way I started. I started as this little kid, you know, entertaining people at parties <coughs> and uh, then putting on a costume and working with somebody else and writing little scripts and putting them on in front of my, my friends and my family, much to their despair. And then there was a wonderful little children's theater. I started when I was nine. I did marionettes when I was nine. Went into a wonderful children's theater, met a wonderful woman who guided me into the Shakespeare Festival. And, and on and on and on, but uh, it was because I loved it and I could not not do it. You know, I was so hungry for it. And also I came from a fairly dysfunctional family which helped. Uh, that's kind of a gentrified word, they're really crazy. So uh, <coughs> that really helped to be able to get into somebody else's skin and get into the dark and pretend that I was someone else. I think that you have to, you have to find that there's a, something in your belly that's really burning that says, I have to do this. Um, because there's an awful lot of rejection that goes on in our business, unfortunately. Um, there's only so many parts in, in, in a play. And, uh, and thousands have, of actors who want to do them. thousands of actors who want to do them. So you're going to have to learn to live with that. <coughs> I think basically you have to do is, is know that you love it, that you love what it represents, what it might be like, um, you have to have that thing burning in your gut. Another question? Mm -hmm. What would you like the audience to take away regarding the fundamental question about uh, whether a physicist has a moral obligation to consider the consequences of his or her action, and how would such implications spread to di other uh, fields of knowledge? Well, uh, I. You should answer that. <laughs> you, you saw the play. I'll, I'll throw that back to you. What did you come away with? What did you, with? Come, away what did you come away with? Okay, Smarty. <laughs> <laughs> what I came away with from the play, I guess, um, was regarding, I guess, the, since the play circles around uncertainty a lot, um, uh, I got a lot of ambiguity from it, but I think that um, mirrors a lot of what we see in the world of ambiguity. So in the end, it's just the individual um, with his choice, his or her choice, sitting there. And not always just well the choice. I mean, sometimes it's it's based on so many other things, and you know, life is uncertain. But there's an action that's taken, and then you glance back and you see what it was, it doesn't, and how it, it affected you. It doesn't matter what profession or it, it, that's you're what, in that's what's either. so common I mean, about it. All I had some <laughs> firemen who came to see it from Detroit or yeah. something. I don't know. They, they came and said, oh my gosh, it was so great. I mean, I got that it was about everyday life. Yeah. You make a decision to climb a pole or to throw a mine, you know, throw a rock at a mine, and then mm -hmm. you don't, oh, they, it's about my life. Boy, if we could Everybody get to, has to yes. deal with consequences of their actions. But that doesn't mean that you get that you're paralyzed before. I mean, you, people have to make hard choices, even though they might know that the consequence is going to be about 48 percent negative. I mean, if it's 52 percent positive, they might have, you might have to go with it. The dangers of dangers knowledge. of knowledge. No, actually, it should be the other way around. Uh, knowledge will help you, you know, just to avoid. I mean, if you think about all the prejudices there are because of ignorance, uh, you know, uh, if you know, that uh, equips you for making the decision that you have to make. Uh, and uh, also about, uh, you know, the moral dilemma of a scientist. Uh, well, you know, people are struggling with that. Uh, we as scientists, we're struggling with that, uh, you know, just like any other uh, person will struggle with whatever decision they have to make. But you do raise an interesting point because we're facing it right now. Who has nuclear capability in this world today is a very, very scary thought. But it does not invalidate the necessity for efficient principles in our everyday life. It's, it's a very high price. And that's where the human condition is so frail. I have another question from the audience. In the play, you go through several drafts of the events that occurred at Copenhagen. Do you can believe that the purpose of the play is to simply go through the drafts, as it were, and prevent, present the options to the audience, or do you think it's more to actually reach the final truth that's at the end of the play? Oh, there's no There is no final, final truth, truth at the end of the play. Have you <laughs> seen the play? Yes, he saw yeah. it. Yeah. It's the imagination. Because I was dying what? to know what the final truth was. <laughs> I mean, well, it's a relative. 
Can I join that just a second? That's yeah. what I meant earlier when I <clears throat> said this is the way historians think. No, no historian that I know would say, well, I've finished the, my project on X, Y, Z. That's the final truth on that. We all know they're only partial truths because we're all working with material and evidence that is partial. And, and we are, approach it from different points of view, from different positions, from different backgrounds. And I can, in the abstract, at least conceive the play. It would be very hard on you, but going through 10 or 12 or 15 drafts, Oy. finding Oy. different meanings every single time. I gotta time. have dinner in between them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we barely get that as it is. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be the most fragile version. <laughs> but yes, I think it's the first part of your question. I think it's, it's in order to illuminate different different shades and sides of, of human beings and commonalities. Mm. So we go how did you, a quick question to each of you, how did you get started in your disciplines? Real quick. I did a second grade production of Rumpelstiltskin and all my friends applauded and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling the truth. <laughs> what about you, Mr. Carey? Uh, I used to, uh, I used to, I remember my father uh, once came down, I, I, used, I used to have the basement of our home. Uh, which was kind of like a rec room, and uh, I was the youngest of five, so I was, I used, I was down there by myself, and uh, I remember my father coming downstairs one time. I had been playing yes. uh, cowboys and Indians, and uh, he said, "Okay, you guys, you can, you've got to go home now. It's time for Len to have dinner." And I said, "Dad, it's just me." I'm going to um, catch the end oh of my this gosh. story. I'm going to catch the end of this story in just a second for oh. all the members of the studio audience because so we're you were out doing of time. all the voices. Oh, oh that's <laughs> you were. It's a great story. <laughs> well, I was. I'm you so were sorry. The whole cavalry. The whole cavalry. But we are out of time today. <laughs> I'd really like to thank all of our guests for being here and with sharing their insights into Michael Frayn's fascinating play Copenhagen. I'd also like to thank the studio audience for being with us and send out a special thanks to the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into the program. If you didn't get a chance to ask your question today, you can contact us by going to the website address on your screen. You can ask additional questions for up to two weeks from today. We'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. If you visit the website, you'll find more information on the play Copenhagen. You'll also find more information on our upcoming programs. We'd like to hear what you think of the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series so we can provide a, an electronic evaluation form for you. It's on the Prince William Network website at www.pwnet.org. We're asking that you fill out this evaluation form so that we can select topics and resources that you need to enhance your classroom experience. Due to illness, our scheduled live performance with Dr. Billy Taylor on March 20th will not be shown. In its place, we'll air All About Jazz, a previous program featuring Dr. Taylor and the Billy Taylor Trio. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for being with us. Can you finish that last story? Well, it was just simply that, that I was uh, downstairs being the cowboys and the Indians, and I was firing the guns, and my father thought that there were about ten of us that came downstairs and said, okay, you guys have to go home.